Hey, Matthew, thank you for joining us. Excellent, thank you. Apologies for the, no problem. Sorry for the confusion. I, I figured it out. I knew it was me. I needed to create an account. I, I missed that thing. No, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, we found each other. Uh, people are joining our, our, our webinar as we speak. We have quite an agenda for today. So uh, I propose we get started. Um, and let me just introduce the agenda for today. Huh? We're going to talk about Snowflake's cost model. And because um, we as Snowflake partners, as Drobos, we often ask questions about um, how does Snowflake charge? How can I influence the Snowflake charges? And how can I actually understand um, how I am uh, paying for my projects? How can I design in terms of, of, of cost, uh, cost reporting? And how can I make sure that my teams are um, working in the most cost efficient way? So um, as Drobos, we have an approach to that. Um, to, the purpose of today's webinar is to introduce that. Um, it's basically using what Snowflake offers out of the box, uh, but we are extending that. Um, and thank you for joining, Matthew, uh, today. Um, maybe you can introduce yourself. Uh, sure, absolutely. So I'm, I'm Matt Shields. Um, I lead the team of uh, partner systems engineers that, that work. Mia. I'm amazed and impressed to hear that they've been partners since 2017, which is, I believe, before I'd even heard of Snowflake. So I've, I've only been with the company about eight months, but I joined primarily because I, I think this is a, an, an incredible opportunity to work with partners. Snowflake is, is a great platform on which partners can build, and it's because of, of, of people like Joris and Tropos that uh, find success in the market. But that's me. Um, look forward to speaking to you all through this. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and uh, as far as I'm, uh, I'm uh, concerned, uh, I'm Joris. I uh, am founder of Tropos. We are a Belgium-based uh, data analytics company. So we do hands-on advisory for modern data analytics. And that means that we help companies who are in on-premise situations to make the shift to cloud, but specifically to their, uh, to their data analytics practice. So we help them design and manage risk. That's our think phase. We help them build uh, their projects. That's our actual build phase. And then afterwards, we often get the question, uh, hey, guys, you, you will not stick, stick around forever. Can you make sure that our own internal teams, they adopt the technology and that they uh, can take it where you, will, uh, where you will leave it after your projects? And that's our run phase. That's where we do coaching, where we do enablement, uh, where we really make sure that um, technology transformations, they get embedded in the organization. Um, as you said, Matthew, um, we are a Snowflake partner since 2017. Um, Snowflake was just um, out of beta at that point. Um, we saw it at some um, some, some larger projects uh, that had with clients, and we decided to move forward with it. Uh, and Tropos grew um, just alongside um, Snowflake in the area. Um, I think we were one of the 20 uh, first um, partners in EMEA, uh, and we are, um, well, mostly folk in Snowflake with the US and, and use a lot of DBT. And DBT, well, we can talk about it afterwards, is an, is an open source framework that makes working with Snowflake really efficient. That's about us. Oh, all right. So this is uh, apologies for the silly, uh, the silly photo here, but um, I had been trying to, to come up with a way how to describe um, Snowflake and our relationship with our partners. And fortunately, somebody that works for me came up with a great analogy. And that Snowflake is a platform is uh, on, on which um, really good things can be built. And it's much like a kitchen. So Snowflake provides one of the best largest scale industrial kitchens that, is, that has ever been made. Um, and around that kitchen, you'll find many tools, pots, pans, knives, blenders. Um, and, and those are all provided by our ISV partners, our, our software partners that provide different tools that, that you, you can work on. But, but really where the magic happens, um, where those meals of data are created are, are by the chefs. And, and we really look at our services partners like Joris and Tropos as chefs that, that do amazing work with, with what we've provided. Um, with, with the platform that we've provided for them. And, and it's, it's absolute pleasure and value to work with our partners. Um, and as, as George said, I, I certainly one of our oldest and, and that's, that's not enough, but one of our most valued partners across Europe. So um, here we are, we wanted to, the, the topic today is, is snowflake pricing and um, how you can best interpret it and ensure that you're controlling and predicting your costs. And, and snowflake pricing on the one hand is, is, is very simple. Um, everything is consumed, Snowflake as, as a product, as, as a service is consumed only by Snowflake credits. Um, Snowflake credits can be 
acquired in a number of different ways directly from Snowflake, from the various cloud partners uh, marketplaces, um, from resellers. Um, you can do it on demand or uh, on, on, on a contract with a reserve. Um, but pretty much what it is, is it's, it's, it's metered down to the, uh, the second. Um, and it, it is a, a combination of different costs and factors, both for uh, storage and compute. Um, but basically, you're only having to pay for what is actually used. And you can turn them off and on at any time. And then we manage everything in the background. And all you're paying for is those services that we provide. And so what makes up the, uh, the components of a, of a Snowflake like credit? So it's, credits are used to pay for the consumption of resources on Snowflake. So it's, it's a unit of measure, and it's consumed only when, when, when a customer is using those resources, um, such as when a virtual warehouse is running, um, the crowd services layer is performing work, or serverless features are being used. Uh, their storage comes in, in different sizes, as well as the compute. So um, the, the compute comes in different sizes, up extra small to uh, uh, XX or 4XL. And, and basically, both the cost and the performance double as you go up through those tiers. And we are introducing 5 and 6XL. Um, they're right now in preview, and that's coming. And you're only charged by the second after the first minute. And you can do instant resizing. Um, up or down, however you want to do it. And you can auto suspend, no charge. And, and this typically makes up, the compute layer makes up about 95% of the cost of Snowflake. And what the credit pricing depends on? Well, there's addition. There's, there's different, different additions of Snowflake. We've, we've got um, standard enterprise business critical and virtual private Snowflake. I'm not going to go through what those different things do. There is a link at the end of this if you would like to get more information uh, about what those different additions entail, but it's basically more capabilities as you move upwards. And the cloud divider. So there's, there's depending on who, where uh, Snowflake is sitting, uh, be that it can be set on Azure or AWS or Google Cloud. Um, your interface will be the same. You'll be coming through Snowflake. It should be basically invisible, but there is a cost differential depending on which cloud provider you're using. And it also is dependent on the region. Um, and that's down to, again, the costs of, of the different cloud providers. All right, so um, cloud services. I, I think the, uh, the storage and compute are, are, fairly, are fairly straightforward, but um, we also um, have cloud services resources. And these are either automatically assigned by Snowflake based on the requirements of the workload, um, or there are additional ones that, that you may choose to use to ad add different capabilities and features. Um, basically, the easiest way to determine whether cloud services layer is being used for a particular query is if it is not assigned to a virtual warehouse. And examples of some of the things that, that we do here are uh, authentication, infrastructure management, um, metadata management, um, access control, and it should be said that that some of our, our, our longtime customers know that these cloud services used to be completely free. Um, however, as we've added more capabilities and more functionality into this, we have started charging for them. But um, typically, um, the vast majority of our customers, the, the, the cloud services layer constitutes only about 10% of, of the usage. And which is nice because we provide 10% of that, of, of your overall bill free within cloud services. So generally speaking, unless you're taking advantage of some of these advanced new features that we've added, um, there will be no, no difference to your bill that you would have seen otherwise. Um, we also have uh, some new capabilities called serverless features. And um, this is right now in, in, in a, a public preview. Um, as, as always with Snowflake, it's always enhancing, always moving forward. And what this is, the serverless compute model for tasks, it enables uh, our, our customers to rely on compute resources that are managed by Snowflake instead of user-managed virtual warehouses. So um, the compute resources are automatically resized and scaled up or down by Snowflake, depending on the requirements of the workload. And we will determine the ideal size of compute resources for a given run based on um, a, a dynamic analysis of, of this and statistics from the most 
previous run, recent previous runs of the same task. So um, the billing for um, runs on serverless tasks, uh, it's, it's right now, it's, it's, it's somewhat different from the standard credit consumption model um, that rely on virtual warehouses. Uh, but it's probably best since A, it's in preview and it's, it's, it's complicated to, again, that information is available on a link that uh, you're going to see. So um, finally, uh, what I wanted to talk about here is, is governance and economy. So um, obviously, as you want to be able to interrogate and understand and, um, and track your spending. So Snowflake provides um, some, some basic core functionality around this. So access history, who is accessing the resources, um, you know, ensuring that the right people have rights um, to access these and, and how much these, these different access usage costs are. Um, so you can track the basics as, as you would. Um, it should be noted that, that some of our partners, um, I think one of them is called Tropos, um, run by a lovely name named Joris, can do some advanced tracking on this and help you with your billing and understanding how your Snowflake resources are being used, which he's going to go on to. Um, and the other thing to, to talk about is, is Snowflake, like much of technology, um, as you would expect, as, as, as we move forward, um, the costs typically go down for the, uh, the, the same functionality. There is price erosion year on year. Uh, what we target and what we've been hitting fairly consistently um, is, is we look for about 25% price erosion year on year. And, and what that means is the, the same, if you were to run the exact same um, functions and, and capabilities from four years ago today, that, that cost would basically be half. Um, so as, as, those, as, as our capabilities increase, our costs tend to go down. Now, like I said, that 25% is a target. Um, there's lots of factors that go into it, as we're all aware, watching some of the horrors that are going on in the world right now, there's, there's lots of external factors that play into it. Um, but that, that's, that's what we target and what we've been fairly consistent in being able to hit. So um, as you can see there, there's a link. It's pretty easy to, to, to remember. Just go to snowflake.com stroke pricing and um, I, I think you can learn anything more and obviously you'll have my contact information if there's anything that, that, you're, that was unclear and I can, I can illuminate for you. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Joris who uh, can talk more a little bit about what they're doing. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, to me, that was a very uh, clear and concise explanation of uh, how the Snowflake cost model works. And what I really remember is that Snowflake um, uses a, a different set of resources for different kinds of purposes and you guys charge um, per second. Um, and that you charge um, using a common uh, denominator called a credit. This credit is actually the unit of cost, right? So um, we, as an implementation partner, we sit on the other hell, on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, people uh, they ask us to uh, to, uh, to engage in projects, to build certain projects, and to use those resources coming from Snowflake. And so we know uh, how to deal with data. We know how to structure Snowflake. We know how to um, sequence all of the different resources on the components to make sure that data gets transformed into some kind of a data product. Uh, some, some data set, some algorithm, some dashboard, some view that is actually able to um, contribute a bit of business value to an end user. And we use those resources for that. But Snowflake doesn't really know what we are building, of course. And because typically we deal with private data, we deal with sensitive things, um, it's large scale, it's in the cloud. And it's only the end client who's able to see and, and decide what's inside the Snowflake instance. Uh, the only thing that Snowflake knows is how to build that. And so Snowflake, they aggregate the cost for warehouses at the compute time, they aggregate the cost for uh, storage, and they aggregate the cost for the, for the service layer. And the client, in the end, just gets to see this cost statement. This cost statement, it can be... Um, um, after the fact, uh, so some clients, they, they deal with credit card payments, they don't have an upfront payment, uh, and they, uh, they just see what they're being charged for on a, on a monthly basis. But many clients, they work with a pre-commit contract. So that means that in the beginning of their fiscal year, contract year, um, those clients, they decide to invest a certain amount of money in Snowflake. That money remains available for um, at least 12 calendar months. And during those 12 calendar months, the client starts to spend um, based on that contract. And during those 12 months, um, especially in the first year, clients really need to, need to learn on how to work with Snowflake. And the cost behavior is different 
during the learning phase of your project and the run phase of your project. And the more efficient your, uh, your uh, engineering team gets, um, the more that mix changes. So actually as a budget owner or as a BI system um, owner, or even as an analytics director, you may want to understand um, the end-to-end -end process. Yeah? You, you want to, to understand what the impact is of a, um, of a project on your cost statement. And you may even want to, um, to understand what the impact is of development uh, on a certain project versus the operations for a certain project. And that is not something that Snowflake can provide out of the box, of course. It is something that you do by designing uh, your projects in a certain way and by maintaining your projects in a certain way. We've gone through this cycle uh, a few times. So when we first started out as, uh, as um, Snowflake engineers, we didn't think of cost at all. And we just found new fancy technology. We built something. And after the fact, these things became popular. Um, costs started to increase a bit and we got questions on um, how, how is this cost composed? And what is this cost going to be next year? So um, we had to think about how we are going to design projects and how, how we are going to, uh, to explain costs um, while these projects go on and, um, and after, the, uh, after their contract year. And this is especially interesting because after this contract year, um, the contract will need to be renewed. And it's always hard to make an estimation on um, how much that renewal is going to be given your current project cost and given your, um, your roadmap. Because once you start with doing cloud um, data analytics, it's never a one-year project. And these things are so popular and so powerful that projects keep on uh, being added on, uh, on such a platform. So we decided to make a framework um, based on that. And that framework is actually based on um, common terminology that is being used in management accounting. And so first we started from the, the point of an engineer, and then we started to look at um, a cloud data platform from the angle of a cost controller, a typical cost controller that you find in many organizations. And cost controllers are used to work with operations, with administration, with transversal uh, processes. But cost controlling for cloud is kind of a new area. Right? So there's a buzzword for that, there's FinOps, but it's basically the same concepts that, that we are now applying to, um, to cloud charges. And we are actually starting from the cost statement that Snowflake is providing. And I put a, 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 just a very brief example of such a statement here on this slide. So what we get at the end of every calendar month is a statement of each type of uh, resource and uh, the consumption um, expressed in euros or in dollars and also expressed in units. The units are less interesting for our explanation here, so I left them behind, but the cost in euros is super interesting. And what you will notice is, as I said, there's no detail about why that cost was, was, was spent. It's just a statement that a certain um, amount of euros was spent. So we need to re-engineer, actually reverse engineer this bill to be able to, uh, to explain this. And the key idea is to use a very common and very modern idea of designing uh, data platforms. And it is to start from the idea of a data product. So if you're agile, and you know that um, different um, user groups within your organization, they evolve at a different pace. So the whole idea of centralizing your whole data warehouse and, and make it one version of the single truth, it's kind of outdated at the moment. Right? So we decided to, to diversify, to make smaller data products and to make sure that we can, uh, we can manage them separately. This idea of a data product, um, it's really aligned with one use case, one project, one type of user group, basically one cost driver. One, one positive increment in your business results. And um, to, um, to make such a data product, we need, a different, uh, we need different kinds of resources in Snowflake. So we need to, to get the data in Snowflake. We need to process the data in Snowflake. We have different ways of processing that data. We can decide to make, to make an intermediate product as something that we can reuse across different products. We can decide to make an end product as something we expose to an end user. And um, we, we can decide to share that across other Snowflake clients as well. And all of these little steps, they have a totally different cost behavior. Um, so we need one kind of an all encompassing um, cloud uh, cost framework to make sure we understand everything. We can, we can tie everything back to one project, one data product. And here is what we came up with. So just working with the, res with the, with the, with the resource name, um, isn't sufficient. Uh, if we design a uh, data platform, we need to make concise decisions, um, which are combinations of what are we going to build in our data platform and how we are going to account for it um, afterwards together with our budget owners. 
And to give an example, um, the most common way of, of diversification uh, in any database or any data platform is of course the way you shape your, your data sets, your tables. Um, you, can, you can design them functionally and gather, uh, gather uh, di different uh, business concepts together and store them in one table, or you can design them technically and making a copy of your source system, wherever your original data resides and taking it over to, to, your, uh, to your cloud data platform. That's a design decision. And you can design it from a technical point of view or you can design it from a cost point of view. It gets a bit more Snowflake specific when we dive into the compute resources. Uh, getting data in um, can be done using two resources, for example. One is called Snowpipe. You pay it per second, but it's a shared resource. One is called a warehouse. Um, it's far more powerful, um, but it comes with other constraints and other advantages. That's already a first design decision to take. If we're smart, and if we think from cost accounting from the start, um, we make it a functional approach. And for example, um, if, we design, if we decide to, to uh, design a warehousing strategy and those compute resources, we can create a warehouse to load data from an external source. We can create a warehouse to transform data um, that's in our platform and that can be, uh, be reused uh, to build other data products. And then we can design a warehouse to um, actually report on those data products. And it's a very easy and simple baseline strategy. Um, it's too simple for a real world example, but it's easy to explain for now. Those are cost objects. And those are things that really are going to generate costs on your uh, platform and that you can aggregate and tie together and, and link up together somehow. And Snowflake has some features for that. Um, we, we used to be able to, um, to uh, annotate every query that we run on the Snowflake platform, but we lost a bit of, of of detail when we did so. And we could only deal with, with uh, the cost of one query. We couldn't aggregate to the cost of a data product in a very easy way. And we really couldn't um, attribute the cost of storing data and maintaining data over time using that way. But now we have a solution for that. And new stuff came in Snowflake. Uh, there's a whole tagging strategy being applied now. Uh, and we can, uh, we can actually start linking these things together. So we can start to introduce these cost controlling concepts. When we decide to um, um, build and expand our data platform, there's going to be um, a number of components that will be shared across data products and things that we build to be efficient, to be cost efficient, and to govern our data platform a bit better. Those are called cost centers. My cost centers are things that can be um, reused. So costs that need to be allocated to data products eventually. Um, typical examples are your data warehouse. Yeah? If you decide to build a data vault, if you decide to build an, uh, an anchor model, if you decide to build some kind of an intermediate layer, um, those are things that an end user typically is not going to consult straight away. It's a bit too, com too, too complex and a bit too technical for them to use. But if you're a data engineer, you really know to how to find your way around it and you know how to build usable data products on top of that. So tagging those cost centers, tagging those shared components with the, with, the, with the notion of a cost center, now, it's a feature that's available since a few months. Now, we can use this, um, and afterwards we will explain on how to use this to, to uh, come up to a, a very specific cost calculation. Those are indirect costs. But luckily, we also have direct costs. Direct costs are a bit easier to, uh, to attribute than indirect costs, because direct costs can be um, linked um, straight away to um, some kind of an analysis and some kind of a user group, uh, a very specific data product. For example, um, these products, projects A and projects B that I put on this slide. And if you tie all of this together, you can see a very, very high level um, overview of um, what a cost strategy could look like uh, for a common data platform in the first uh, year of, of, of its existence. And so we need warehouses to uh, build shared um, objects. We need warehouses to um, derive data products from these shared objects. We need snow pipes to feed data into these um, data products. And then we need storage. And storage in Snowflake is a bit particular compared to other platforms because we have this great feature called time travel. And so when you store data in Snowflake and, and it, it, uh, it changes over time, Snowflake really keeps track of every change um, in the table or in the data structure 
somewhere between seven days and 90 days uh, on top of my mind, depending on the, on the, on the licensing model um, that Matthew mentioned. So tying all of this together is really the key to um, making sure that you can understand uh, what the cost of a certain data product is. And tying this together is basically very straightforward on paper. Huh? You can, you can take your cost units and your direct costs, and then you add the uh, share of the cost center, your indirect cost um, that has been made up front. You add the two together, and then you know the cost of a project. That's super easy and uh, super powerful um, when you tie it up to your BI tool. And a very, very common use case is um, creating a, a warehouse, so a, a unit of compute, um, and tie that warehouse to a specific dashboard, a commonly used dashboard, or a set of dashboards, or a department, or a group of departments, depending how um, budgets and costs are being managed in your organization. To be able to see the full cost, um, you somehow need to do some calculations. And the complexity in running those cal calculations is not in understanding the direct costs. It's in attributing the share of the indirect cost to the direct cost. And to understand, for example, how much compute we spent to build the data vault and how much of that data vault is going to contribute to your, say, COVID-19 data set or your IoT machine learning data set. It's complex because these calculations happen over time. And some of these uh, costs are being made when new data becomes available. Data typically gets loaded in Snowflake and stays there for a while. And once a day, once a night, once an hour, new data gets processed into some shared layer and just stays there for a while. And then depending on the platform strategy, you can run um, data products um, live on this common data, or you can decide to copy that uh, common data over to newer data product, products at another point in time and make sure you, um, you get another kind of efficiency um, in there. So this time dependency is super complex to, to manage actually and to shape. So somehow we need to really express the relationships between those different resources, those different design decisions we make as engineers and the cost impact of all of that end to end. We've had this question a few times uh, from customers. Um, and um, up till a few months back, we had to say, hey, it's possible to do this, but it will need a bit of manual maintenance. We will need to create some allocation tables. We really need to look on how, how, to, how we engineer. Uh, we need to build some custom calculations and it's all gonna be very specific. Basically, we had to maintain a meta platform for our data platform where the meta platform would really explain how we use the data platform. It was a, was a bit of an overhead. And as you can imagine, um, it, it's all good in games and fun when, when you start out, but it's very tough to maintain. So at some point, improvements came. And Snowflake came up with this idea of um, object tagging. And an object tagging is, is really like putting a sticker, almost a physical sticker, on something you create in Snowflake. And that something can be a warehouse, it can be a table, it can be, it can be a snow pipe, it can be any kind of object you can create as an engineer to make sure you get you you end up um, with, a, with a data product in the end. And by being very smart in how we use those uh, object tags uh, in combination with the idea of a, of a cost center and a uh, cost unit, we can uh, we can start laying out the basic framework uh, for cost analysis. We are, able, we are able to identify those cost drivers, cost units, and cost <coughs> centers. But we don't have um, everything to tie the whole thing together yet. So those relationships. And to be able to define those relationships in a very efficient way that actually doesn't require any maintenance at all, we have to be very concise in how we apply best practices for Snowflake. So if you use Snowflake right, you use an ELT approach. You extract your data from your source system, you load your data in your source system, and then you start transforming your data while it is in your source, in, in, in your uh, data platform. And to be able to be very efficient uh, in this T step, in this transformation step, we really like using this framework called TBT. It's an open source framework. 
um, the open source core version is free for use. Um, but meanwhile, the company behind DBT and DBT Labs raised, I think, over 400 millions in, uh, in funding and is uh, valued over 4 billion. So this is really like the engine behind running a very efficient um, transformation platform. And DBT is extendable. So if you really know how uh, your way around DBT, and we've been using this for the past three years at least, you really know how to um, influence the behavior so that you can reuse things that DBT does natively out of the box. So while you design transformations, you really explain DBT how to, uh, how to put relationships between different tables and different, uh, different objects in your data platform. It is DBT who decides how to generate your common uh, data layer, your data vault, your anchor model. And it is DBT that decides how to build your data products on top of those things. So if we can create a plugin for DBT, that is able to um, write back all of these relationships into some sort of an allocation system, we have our missing link. As platform engineers or cost analysts, we would have to tag those different objects. As dbt engineers, we would have to just plug in this, this shared module that we created for dbt. And um, upon every run of your data platform, and it can be every hour, it can be even every second, typically it is, it is once a day, we can get an updated cost statement. And that cost statement can be a full 360 of, uh, of your data platform. Interesting thing here is that um, it is fully native to Snowflake. It doesn't require any um, maintenance at all. It is being uh, plugged into any sort of, uh, of, of DBT project and it's actually written in code. So it's something that we built um, because certain clients uh, really demanded very specific cost, uh, cost analysis on top of their data platform. But it's something that we started maintaining ourselves uh, in the background. And as we are really close with Snowflake, we have a bit of a view on the roadmap. Uh, we can anticipate on, on changes on the roadmap and we are able to uh, optimize our own in, uh, internal framework um, to really benefit from the new features as soon as they become available. This is something that we typically start using on every project. And uh, as soon as we really understood how to use cost, cost controlling principles on top of data platforms, we, we really started to designing data clouds um, from a cost per perspective from the start. And um, we've been doing this now for, uh, for a while. Uh, technically, there's no impact at all, uh, which I can say because we've been really close to, to many projects lately. But the kind of insight you get uh, is tremendous. And it really helps clients to instill confidence in the development and the extension of a data platform. It really helps clients, clients to, to, uh, to have faith in cost evolution. And it's really helpful in terms of budgeting at the end of the fiscal year uh, to make sure that the extension of the data platform uh, can go on in a meaningful way. So um, what are the typical questions uh, that we get? It is basically, as we, as we mentioned in, in the beginning, um, how much does a project cost? Sometimes used for internal charge truths, uh, sometimes for uh, um, investment decisions or, or disinvestment decisions. By having um, the information from the previous slides, you are really able to pinpoint to the euro cent or to the dollar cent what the cost of a project is. But it doesn't really stop there. As an engineer or as a cost controller, you're um, responsible for um, tagging the, uh, the reason why you have built something and with a cost center or a cost unit. But if you don't, those costs are still being made and they're still being visible in your platform. So if somebody would decide to build something because they like it, but there's no business reason for it, it would be visible and it can be attributed actually to the very start of the, of the project uh, decision. We can even see who built it, or why they built it, when they built it, and what the actual cost built up over time was. That's the second reason we uh, typically get cost controlling questions. And a third reason why we typically uh, see them is to understand the cost of development versus the cost of running a project. And that's important. Um, typically, when you deal with larger data sets, when engineering teams just start out with using cloud data platforms, they are still learning how to size warehouses and how to deal with warehouses and how to deal with larger data sets and how to sample or not sample data from larger data sets. And 
it's perfectly okay to start out with using large warehouses on large data sets. But across time, it's important um, to evaluate the cost of those kinds of developments versus the cost of actually taking those developments to production and having end users use those, uh, use those uh, systems. Once you've made that step, um, you can start optimizing the way your uh, development teams deal with using warehouses, so deal with using compute costs. And that's how you can start um, changing the way your um, development teams are actually instructed to do some kinds of development. That's where you typically step away from um, using the um, traditional way of engineering data platforms and data warehouses. You may step into areas such as test-driven development, uh, which is um, using actual samples of actual um, expected outcomes of, of data products uh, without having the actual data. It's a super powerful technique. It is used in, uh, in, in, in many ways. Um, but it takes a bit of adoption for your data team uh, before, you, before they can get there. And we typically don't start using techniques like these um, before we are really seeing business use cases and that drives into that direction. Um, what I wanted to say is that this is a dashboard that can be typically built on top of the output of our DBT uh, system. And this DBT plugin is really something you can add into, uh, in, into your current DBT uh, project or a new DBT project, or even sometimes um, in another project um, to, to make sure that you get uh, this kind of visibility. Our DBT module, it just generates um, cost um, statements, internal cost statements, uh, stores it as tables, and any kind of BI tool can report on top of it. And we have examples with Tableau, we have examples with Power BI, and sometimes even with Looker, um, sometimes with Metabase, which is a super popular open source um, reporting tool. And they're all able to uh, to give you the full 360 view of um, of costs. Now that was, in a nutshell, a very concise explanation. I hope of um, how cost controlling and how cost management uh, could be set up on your Snowflake data platform, and um, how how it could evolve over time. So I didn't know. I didn't mention that um, we had a. a, a an option for Q&A um, in this webinar uh, that was on the right-hand side of, uh, of the chat screen. And a few people, um, they did send a message. So there are a few small questions. Um, we have a few minutes left. And um, let me take two of them. Well, so um, one person asked, hey, um, I have a Snowflake instance already set up. And uh, the DBT uh, plugin seems interesting. Um, but I'm not using dbt, I'm using some kind of another uh, transformation uh, tool. Can I retrofit? Uh, yeah, you can retrofit. Um, there's a few um, design assumptions that you will um, need to make, that we will need from the start. So it might uh, be necessary to reshape a few things. But in general, uh, whether you use dbt for your full data platform or you're not using it at all and you just want to use it for, uh, for cost accounting, um, that option exists. And uh, then there was a second question. Uh, is this approach limited to Snowflake cost? Can I add my other cloud resources? Um, and then I'm thinking, can I add um, my cost statements from AWS, for example? Uh, when, um, when you use resources um, that are outside of Snowflake, but somehow contribute to uh, building data platforms and building data products. Um, if that's the question, um, and then please, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, then the answer is yes. You can definitely um, export your AWS, your Azure, um, your, your, your data dog costing um, into some kind of an, uh, a landing zone for your, for your, for your uh, cost in Snowflake. And then you can start applying the principles from a, from a cost accounting approach um, to, to attribute those costs to your data products. That's definitely an option. Uh, we've done it for uh, for one client um, without um, actual adaptions to, to our framework. So that should work. And now I noticed that we are one minute, uh, that we have one minute left uh, from our uh, allocated 45 minutes. So um, Matthew, is there something you still want to add? Uh, no, no. I, I suppose the only thing I wanted to add was a big thank you to those uh, of you that attended, and a huge thank you to uh, to yours for setting this up. Um, 
really, really, really appreciate it. And please, if, if there's anything that I can assist with or help with, please do feel free to reach out. You've got my contact details. And um, that's it from me. Then uh, uh, there's uh, nothing left uh, for me to say, but uh, thank you, Matthew, for attending us, uh, helping us out with the webinar. Thank you for everybody in the in the call and in the chat uh, for your contributions, for your interests, uh, for your questions. Uh, we are made available for questions. So if you want to, to catch up on uh, how to do cost accounting for Snowflake, how to set up uh, data platforms in terms of cost reporting afterwards, or just something general about uh, DBT and uh, how we set up projects, please reach out. Um, I'm Joris at tropos.io. Our website is www.tropos.io. Uh, you can reach us uh, directly or through uh, LinkedIn. Thanks again for your uh, interest, uh, for your contributions, and I hope to see you uh, next time for another webinar. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.